All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. So, Father, we're already thankful for the way that you're moving in the service. We're thankful that your Spirit's here. Father, we're thankful that your Spirit has freedom to move and touch our hearts and sensitize our ears to you. I ask now that as we enter into the word portion of worship, that you would continue to have freedom to speak to us, to encourage us, and for some of us to invite us along, maybe on the journey with you for the first time. And so, Father, I ask now that uh, you would just bless our time together. In your name I pray. Amen. So, most of the time when you're learning how to speak, actually, I, I took a pulpit speech class. Can you believe that? And they taught us how to pray in King James English. I don't do that anymore because I don't know what those words mean. So, anyway, they always would teach you, you know, about putting your best foot forward and all those kind of things. And then later we hear about you want to start with the why before you go to the what and the how, right? How many of you have heard that before? Okay, well, that's usually what happens. But today I'm going to mess with that, and we're going to start with the what, then we're going to go to the why, and then to the how. Is that okay? All right, I don't want to freak any of you out now, so just bear with me, all right? You ready? Today we're going to talk about intentional community. So one of the amazing things that happens after Jesus' death is that he's around a few more days, and then he ascends into heaven. And then we pick up this story in the book of Acts. Acts is kind of the last of our storybooks, if I can say it that way. And then after that, beginning in Romans, we come to the epistles, the instructions to the church and how the church is supposed to operate and live, et cetera, et cetera. And so Acts is still telling us the story, but it's telling us the story of what happens now that we've been exposed to Jesus. And there's this really interesting passage in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 where things just changed, and it begs the question, what just happened? Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, I want you to read it with me, it says this. All believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. And they, all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property, possessions, and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and other food. Can't leave brisket out. Uh, <laughs> Lord's Supper and shared meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord, what? Added to their fellowship who were being saved. Now, to set up this story, Peter stands up one day. It's, it's after he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he stands up, and he delivers this, this great sermon. And some people, and I can relate to this. You probably think the same of me sometimes, where they're going, you know what, that guy Peter's drunk. <laughs> that explains what's happening. Because a, real, a really weird miracle took place. God worked a miracle in people's ears because when Peter was speaking his language, other people heard it in their language. That would be really cool, right? See, you don't need classes to teach you Spanish and French and all that. Just, just pray for the gift of tongues or the gift of ears. I don't know. But anyway, so many cool things. And so after that, 3,000 people came to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior and were baptized. 3,000 people. I don't think it's fair that that was the first sermon. Because that puts pressure on the rest of us. That is some 3,000. Are you with me today? Do I need to come out there and wake you up? That is a huge response. Can you imagine the, the guy that had to speak next time? Like, <laughs> anyway, just know it's intimidating. But anyway, so something really special happened. Out of 
this message that was preached and people coming to Jesus, they started operating in weird ways. Their community was based on sacrifice. I want you to see this in Acts 2. Completely different community. So it was known for sacrificing. Now, they're not sacrificing hospitality, but how many of you have had to, been, have, to have been hospitable even when you're not very good at it? It can be draining sometimes, right? Especially when people leave your house a mess, right? Are you with me? Oh, some of you, okay, that's it. Last warning, all right? So anyway, so it was known for its hospitality. They sacrificed their time. They said that they were constantly meeting together and listening to teaching. And then they were in each other's homes sharing meals and all of those kind of things. And then they sacrificed their food. And listen, my brothers and my sisters, under Roman rule, food wasn't cheap, right? We kind of know that story now, don't we? But anytime you want to complain, you can go to Canada. You can go there and buy your, you know those little one-cup bag of cheese things? How much is that here? How much? $3.99? Okay, try $8.99 in Canada. Or a gallon of milk, $8.99. So, yeah, so food is expensive. And so... These people were opening their homes, and they're sharing in meals, and they're fellowshipping together. And then you see that they also shared in their finances. You know, it's interesting that the church community is the very first community recorded in history that they actually took up an offering, gave it to a missionary, and that person took the money to another community for their benefit. That had never happened in the history of the world until the church. The church was designed after the pattern of Jesus because was not Jesus kind of all these things? His sacrificial way of living, his sacrificial life. And so this community was actually patterned after Jesus. But the great thing is, is they didn't have a meeting about it. We like to meeting things to death sometimes, don't we? They didn't have a meeting. This just kind of spontaneously happened. The Holy Spirit was in charge. And so what happens after the book of Acts is that the epistles, the writers of the epistles are trying to, if I can say it, bring out concepts and and bring out ideas Out of this, so all the communities where churches were being planted, they could take those core values and concepts and build the communities in their cities. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah? I hope so, because you're here because of it, right? So it's it's really, really cool stuff. And so one of the things that that happens, though, um, is sometimes we, I know this, this isn't us, but and none of us do this, but sometimes we kind of complicate things, don't we? Yeah, sometimes we just like things to be a little easier, and there's always that special person in your life, that special helper that likes to make it a little more difficult, and you just thank the Lord for them, right? Yes, yes. For those of you that don't know, we call them children, but anyway, I'm just joking. I'm just joking, but I want to teach you today this idea called first principles, Okay? Everybody say it with me. First principles. And this is really important for our discussion today. So let's say you have a tank, and you have a boat, and you have a bicycle. All right? And you take all of them apart, and you lay out all the pieces, and then you bring in people that have no idea what it was previously. And you say to them, here are all these pieces, now go build something. What could you build out of that? I think it would be really cool to have a bicycle that shoots big things at things, right? <laughs> that can float on the water or whatever, right? You, I mean, the opportunity is endless because you've got these core principles 
that you're working with that you can design something new, you can design something that fits you better, and maybe you come up with something a little more gas efficient than a tank. You know, like creativity, right? Like make it your own. Are you with me? And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at, beginning today and over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12. Now, Romans chapter 12, in my opinion, is the premier chapter on community in Scripture. It, it's premier. It, 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 it has some incredible things and concepts for us to wrap our heads around. And so Paul is going to take what happened in Acts, and he's going to break it down into principles for us so that we can create a community that fits who we are, right? That is still known by what the Acts 2 community was known by. Pretty cool story, right? All right. So anyway, so we are going to look at today Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, Normally, I preach out of the New Living Translation. Today, we're going to look at the Phillips Translation. I was going to do the PRT Translation, but Pastor Ron was sick, and I couldn't get him to translate it for me. Remember a few weeks ago, we spoke out of the Pastor Ron Translation? So anyway, today, you're going to have to go with the Phillips Translation. And so the Phillips translation, um, it's just a translation of the New Testament, and sometimes I find the way that things are worded, they're very, very thought-provoking. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship, to give your bodies a living sacrifice consecrated to him and acceptable by him. Now, again, there are so many different translations. Some translations say, you know, sacrifice yourself as your reasonable act of worship, right? How, how many of you kind of know it that way? Well, anyway, when you, when you dig into this passage a little bit, Paul is sharing with us our very first principle, that is going to make community work. And he actually says that this isn't a knee-jerk response. This isn't an emotional response, not that those are bad all the time, but this isn't an emotional response that you're going to turn around later and go, oh, man, what did I just do? How many of you do that? Yes. My wife has it a little different. It's more like, oh, Lord, what did Shane just do? But anyway, um, and so here it says you know, when you approach and you look at things, and I love this, with your eyes wide open, and you see the mercies of God. Now, this just isn't the mercy of salvation. This is mercy of past, present, and future, because thank the Lord, Scripture say, says his mercies are new, what? Every morning. And I'm so thankful for that because I burn through mine every day, right? So I'm so thankful that there is mercy for us, continued mercy. And so what Paul says is, is that when you view that with your eyes wide open, remember we talked about the prism in which we look at Scripture, and when you open your eyes wide open and you see what Jesus has done for you, it's going to lead you to make an intelligent decision that, hey, the one that sacrificed all for me, I in return, I'm going to sacrifice all for him, right? That's what it talks about, becoming a sacrifice. Jesus talked about this. He says, if you really want to be my disciples, you have to what? Pick up your cross daily and follow me. There is a dying to self that has to happen. And some of you are way more righteous than me. I have to do that pretty much every hour of every day. <laughs> are you with me? And so we see here that Paul is really bringing home the first principle of sacrifice. Now, if you notice here, this first principle of sacrifice, he did not say, find a community that is going to sacrifice for you. It says what? You're in a community where you're what? Sacrificing. See, that's what flips the Jesus community 
and the world community upside down. It, it's completely different. So in an age, and listen, we often harp on how bad our time is. Trust me when I tell you this, it's not as bad as it has been. If you read history, you know it's been a lot worse, right? And so here we have this moment where this community is flipping things on its head, and it says don't enter into community thinking about what you can get out of it, but rather what you can give to it. And that is an important distinction. Sometimes as a pastor over the last 30 years, I've had people that have come to me and said, you know, shame, we're thinking about leaving the church or stepping out of youth ministry or whatever. And, and usually the question that follows is why. They say, well, I'm just not being fed enough. And then what I usually do is I pose the question back, well, if you're not being fed, maybe it's time for you to feed. And before you make the choice to leave community, you need to ask yourself the question. You need to pray about, does God have you here not really to receive right now, but to give? Because my brothers and my sisters, community is a both and. It is consuming and it is giving. If you consume too much, that's bad. If you give out too much and not receiving, that's bad. Are you with me? And so Paul is really driving home here this idea around sacrifice. It's, it's my intelligent thought. It's, it's my intelligent way, and I'm sacrificing. It's not emotional. I'm sacrificing for Jesus and for the community that he's created. And Paul actually says that this is worship. See, worship, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I feel so blessed that we can come in to worship like this every week. This side's doing pretty good. This side's waking up. I don't know what's going on back here, but there needs to be some spirit jumping up and through here. All right, I'm just playing with you. But it's, it's worship. It, it's this ongoing, like, we have this sacrificial system in the Old Testament, and the only part of that's carried over is that it's me putting me on the altar. It's me saying to Jesus, I'm yours. It's me saying to the community in which I'm involved in, which is new life, is that I'm yours. And I want you, I want to help you become closer to Jesus. And I want you to help me become closer to Jesus. Do you see how that works? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. And it's actually considered worship. Now let's look at verse 12. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Don't allow the world to squeeze you into its uh, own mold. But let God remold your minds within so that you may prove in practice that God's plan for you is good and meets all the demands and moves towards the goal of true maturity. So I want to pause here, and I want to break out a couple of things before I jump into the first principles. So first of all, you know, this idea um, around, and I want you to see it. It's, it's still up here. It says, so that you may prove in practice what practice that God's plan for you is good. See, here's, here's part of the issue. A lot of times when we approach faith, and, and, and we all do it, we, we come at it from more of an intellectual consumeristic type of, of stance. We approach it as, you know, this is what Jesus did for us, and I'm learning more about Jesus, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, my knowledge base is increasing. But oftentimes in Scripture, the word no is not something where you sit down and you learn math facts. Praise God. How many of you like math? Oh, Lord, have mercy. But anyway, it's not like that. It's, it's literally about experience. Experiencing. So if you want to know, Shane, 
sure, my mom can give you a lot of facts about Shane that she won't do because she loves me. <laughs> right? But if you want to really know me, you need to do life with me. Let's share a meal. Let's get in a small group together. Let's, let's go serve together. Let's hear each other's stories. Let's communicate and, and do life together. That's what it means to know. It's not just intellectual. It's actually in the way of doing life. You're experiencing more, so you're coming to know more. And part of the thing that's tough, especially in Western Christianity, is Western Christianity, and a lot of times, is all about the Sunday morning, the bigger crowd, all of those things. None of that's bad. It's all good. It's all okay. But what this is talking about is that information you get on Sundays, that information that you're learning in your devotions, that information that you're learning in small groups. There's got to be a point in time where you put it to use. Because if you don't put it to use, what does it say here? It's only in the practice that you come to know that God's plan for you is good. We have to practice it. Actually, how many of you have ever come up through an apprenticeship program? Anybody? Well, there's part of the apprenticeship program that you're learning. And then the other part is, hey, it's now time for you to tear the engine apart yourself. I've got no problem tearing engines apart. Daniel, it's just putting them back together. I'll just struggle with. But, but I'm starting to put things in practice. I'm starting to experience it. I'm, I'm starting really to understand what the teacher is saying. And you know what? I have to shift a few things that the teacher says in order for it to make sense in my mind. And so it's that type of practice that we come to know that God's plan is good. So if you really want to know whether God's plan is good for you or not, the first thing you have to do is sacrifice and join a community. Start living it out. Start living it out. See, serving is that part that fuels us. I, I, don't, I know there's, we're a church and we love going to Mexico, right? There is something special about going to the mission field and doing things you've never done before. And mission trips will ensure that you're going to do things that you've never done before. Amen? Yeah. I had this one youth, kind of a crazy story, but uh, we were in Mexico working with an orphanage, and like so many times, there was plumbing issues. And... So we had to dig a trench to get the pipe out, and when we dug the trench, we realized that all that good stuff was not going in the pipe it should go in, but it created a huge puddle, right? And have you ever had one of those youth or been around a teenager where they're just not going to listen to you? They're going to have to learn the hard way. Okay. Well, I had this one teenager. I won't say his name just in case he's stalking me somewhere. But I said to him, bro, you're not going to want to stand there because we're throwing dirt into that hole to kind of absorb all that fun stuff, and you really don't want to be there. Well, I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to do it anyway because it's just closer to the hole. And I'm like, man, you really don't want to do that. And he's like, Shane, I got it. I'm like, okay. So when we start throwing it in, when you throw something in water, it what? Splashes. And so he got covered with poo. <laughs> that has nothing to do with Jesus. So that's just a free story about <laughs> sacrificing and about experiencing things. But one of the things that I've always come back from mission trips thinking is how easy it is to do ministry in a different culture than ours because we tend to complicate things. But it's not supposed to be complicated. If your eyes are wide open and you see Jesus who made incredible sacrifices for you and showed and demonstrated amazing love to you and mercies that are ongoing every day, 
Should that not be the top priority of how our time, finances, talents, gifts work? Amen? Because Scripture says, where your treasure is, there is your what? Heart. And so this is more than just talking about small groups or more than talking about church community. This is also about heart, where your heart is. And so I just want to encourage us as we're going through this series on community that we all ask that question, where's my heart? But I want to teach you a couple of other principles here. So first one, after, there we go. So the very first thing that Paul says is get out of the box. All right? So I was watching this Adidas commercial one time. This was several years ago. How many of you like Adidas? I like Adidas. They're great shoes. Nothing bad. No trick questions here. You're not going to hell because of it. Right? And I was watching this, this thing, and this girl was getting ready, and she's going to a party at her friend's place, and it says, be original. And she put on her Adidas. She goes into the party. You know, I think it's a party where none of the parents are home because there's no adults and the stuff they're doing, right? And everybody's jumping and dancing and having a great time. But then you begin to notice everybody at the party has Adidas on. And the tagline is, be original. I'm like... You're all wearing Adidas. I don't see any Converse in there at all or any Nikes. No, it was all Adidas. And so we like the idea about being different, about being out of the box, but a lot of times we don't like the practice of it. We don't like to be that one person, right? And what the picture is here, and this is a beautiful picture, Paul says what the world system, now again, we're talking about world. We're not talking about people. We're talking about systems and values that are moving those systems forward. They want to put you in a box and keep you small. See, our community wants to define you easily. They actually are really good at putting labels on you. Amen? Well, you're this, or you're that, or you're this. And listen, in, in my world, Shane's conviction I'm not determined by being an American. I'm not determined by being white. I'm not determined by being a father or a husband or a son. It's I am a child saved by grace. And my identity is locked in Jesus. And what Jesus wants to do is pull us out of the box where they're trying to label, confine, make small and not have any influence, that's what the world system is. That's what it does. And so Paul says, you know what? You need to think about sacrifice because sacrifice is the key to unlocking the box. So get out of the box. Don't let that define you. Well, then you say, Shane, what do I do if I get out of the box? Well, I want you to be a butterfly. Yes, I said that. I want you to be a butterfly. I want you to flap around. No, I'm just playing. That's a joke. But this word, don't be conformed, shrunk, made small. Don't be that, but be transformed. This, this, it's where we get the idea of metamorphosis. It's where the caterpillar goes in, and he takes a really long nap, and then when he wakes up, he realizes he has wings. And now those wings have made it possible for him to grow and go places he never thought he could. It's a beautiful picture. So God says, listen, my plan for you is not to keep you small like the world. My plan for you is to enlarge you and your influence in the world. So if we really want this type of community, the first thing we have to do is we have to say, okay, because of what Jesus has done for me, I'm prepared to sacrifice all that I am and all that I have in order to follow Jesus. The second step is to realize that I've been thinking too small. I've been acting too small. The world has had too much confining influence on my life. And once I realize that, and I realize that I have the key, I can unlock the box and be transformed from the inside out. 
transformed from the inside out. We all get to become butterflies. And I know there's some men's men in here and saying, why can't you say an eagle? Because Paul didn't say eagle, <laughs> right? Yeah, a moth. There we go. That's probably more like me. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. <laughs> So th this is what these principles are. And so if you take the principle of sacrifice and we take the principle of out-of-the-box thinking, what can Jesus do with us as individuals and a community to broaden our influence and to encounter a world that we never thought we would encounter? Because my brothers and my sisters, remember that story back in Acts chapter 2? Sometime, Pastor Ron will tell you the story, but had it not been for that passage, we would not be here today. It was formative for him. But here's the trick. If it hadn't have been for what happened in Acts chapter 2, the entire globe wouldn't be doing what we're doing today. It would have fizzled out. But Jesus was, had such a profound impact and his spirit was moving that this was just the natural next step for what happened after Resurrection Sunday. It birthed a community like the world has not seen. And my brothers and my sisters, all the good and all the bad that the church has done, we have shaped the world. And that is undeniable. No government, no world leader, has shaped the world any more than Jesus and the church. It just hasn't. If it hadn't been for the churches, the majority of universities that our kids go to, they would not exist. Because they were started in this idea of equipping people to know Jesus. Amen? The first book ever printed was a Bible. So see, something happens when you grab a hold of these principles. Something takes place when we start living in a community that is known for sacrificing. Saying, what can I contribute? And trust me, when you contribute, you get something back. 100%. And then we loosen our thinking. Like, church, one of the things I'm looking forward to in our years together, because we're going to be here a long time, amen? And one of the things I'm excited about is saying, okay, we need to stop our box thinking and start doing the butterfly thinking. What does that look like? Why? Because God wants us to continue to grow and expand and have more influence. And so when we take these things seriously and we begin to put them in action, I believe with all my heart we will have the same impact on our community that Acts chapter 2, those individuals did on their community. So let us pray. Oh, before we do that, sorry, got a few questions for you to think through. Now, these are going to sting a little. They stung me. And so because I love you, I'm going to sting you too. But anyway, here's some questions to think through. You might want to take a picture of these or whatever on the slides. But how many days of the week do you take up your cross and sacrifice yourself in worship? If you're not, set a goal and see what happens. Set a goal and see what happens. Are you actively involved in this community? If not, what sacrifices do you need to make in order to participate? Thirdly, what's your main fear? of keeping you from making the sacrifice. It could be past pain, past trauma. It could be the fact that maybe the enemy's really hammering on you and make you feel like you don't have anything to contribute. Listen to me, my brothers and my sisters. When the enemy does that, you're candidate number one for making things happen. So just think through that. And then lastly, going back to that verse, how do you know God's will for your life if you're not in community and not sacrificing? A lot of people say to me, Shane, I want to know what God's will for my life is. 
My answer is do the things that Jesus told you to do. Because when you do that, you start moving. And it's a whole lot easier to turn the course of a moving ship than a stationary ship. Are you with me? So these are incredibly important. So take these this week. Think through them. And then answer those questions. And you know what? When you wake up, his mercies are new every morning. Let us pray. So, Father, I come before you now, and I'm so thankful for this passage of Scripture. I am so thankful that Paul took these ideas and concepts and wrote them down for us to see that while these are big things, they're not out of the realm of possibility. That actually if we put these things together, our whole world opens up in ways that we never even dreamt or thought possible. Father, I pray for the person here today that maybe hasn't entered into relationship with you and they've been thinking about it. Father, today I pray that they would make the intellectual choice of saying yes and then sacrificing their life to the one who loves them most. Father, I am so thankful you are worthy of all our praises. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.